No membership test, no lines of birth or race or accomplishment, a church for people who have made errors. That's what this church is here for. You want a church that's made for sinners, just a whole lot like you, this is the place. Hello, and welcome to Faith for Today. Did you know that belonging to a church can actually help prevent drug and alcohol abuse? Research conducted by Columbia University found that people with religious faith are markedly less likely to abuse alcohol and illegal drugs than non-believers. That's incredible. So why would faith make such a difference in substance abuse? The study cited the positive impact of religious teaching or the sense of belonging to a group or that faith fills a need that makes substance abuse unnecessary. Though I don't deny that those things could contribute to the difference, I'd have to say the real difference is the transforming power of Jesus hmm. Christ. He changes lives. That's right. God has issued an invitation for you to be a part of something that can change your life as well. Jesus' story of a king who held a banquet tells that you are invited to be a part of God's great family. We're so happy that you've tuned in today. And if you'd like to view this or previous programs, join us on the web at faithfortoday.tv. There you can watch programs, you can order books, you can find out about other programs that are produced by this ministry. We'd also like to invite you to become a part of the Faith for Today team by helping keep us on the air. As a way of saying thank you for a donation of any size, we'll send you a copy of Mike's book, Journal of a Lonely God. You can send your donation to Faith for Today, Post Office Box 1000, Thousand Oaks, California, 91359. If you can't make a donation just now, but you'd still like to have one of Mike's books, just call the number on the screen and we'll be happy to send you a free copy of Jesus, Your Heart's Desire. This easy to read book has 28 short devotionals, perfect for helping you begin your day with the one your heart truly longs for. It's about time to begin our study. But before we do, let's sing praises to the God who invites us to belong to His great family. If religion was a thing that money could buy, the rich would live and the poor would die.
Lori Alvord and Elizabeth Van Pelt tell us that when the Navajo give birth to a baby, a very special uh, custom occurs after the first time that the baby laughs. Whoever makes the baby laugh for the first time must then throw a party. They must invite people in, and they buy candy for this party, but they also buy rock salt. And so when, when they have the party, the baby gives pieces of rock salt to everyone who comes through, and then they pass out the candy, and everyone eats as they have a party together. You see, they believe that in doing this, that the baby will grow up to be a truly generous person. They think that the moment the baby first laughs is important for this reason. They say that that's the time when the spirit or the soul is affixed to the body. That's when it's attached. Laughter indicates that the soul has been attached to the body. Now, obviously, we don't believe everything that they would teach about this, but maybe they're onto something. I think that laughter is a sign that your soul is in good shape. Why shouldn't we laugh? We're the nobodies. God is invited to the banquet. Robert Stallman has written, divine invitations to eat and drink occur at the beginning and end of the Bible like bookends, which embrace the unfolding story of redemption, stretching from creation to new creation. The zenith of the drama is also marked by the language of divine hospitality in Jesus' offer of the bread and cup to his disciples, an act laden with theological symbolism. You see, God invites us to eat and to drink with him. He surprises us with his generosity. He also surprises us with his enjoyment of life, with his joy. God longs for us to enjoy life as well. God wants us to experience his joy. That's why God has invited us to the banquet. Revelation speaks of such a banquet that will take place in heaven. John the Revelator describes a time of food and drink and laughter and celebration. He describes a time of unspeakable joy, of praise, and yes, again, laughter. In fact, one New Testament word used to describe the joy that a Christian experiences when they recognize God's acceptance of them is the, is the Greek word from which we get our work our word, hilarious. That's the joy that the sinner receives when he recognizes he's been accepted by the Father. It's the word from which we get our word, hilarious. Laughter, joy, celebration. The Bible begins and ends with the invitation. God invites us to the party. He invites us to eat with him in order that we might celebrate our salvation. And now he wants us to join in the laughter. Jesus told a parable about a banquet in Matthew 22 that parallels the parable we read in Luke chapter 14. But there are some differences of Matthew's telling of this story that are worth noting. So open to Matthew chapter 22, starting with verse 2, if you would please. Matthew 22, starting with verse 2. Follow along as I read. And notice the differences in this parable of the banquet. It says, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, tell those who have been invited that I prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted calf have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged and sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite the banquet to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out to the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad, and all the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, He noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. In ancient times, when a feast was first proposed, a general invitation went out 
to those who would be invited. However, no specific date or time or day was set for the banquet. It was just basically a warning, watch for a specific invitation. Be ready for the specific invitation. The reason for this is this. Um, basically, the unpredictable nature of first century delivery schedules for the message and for ingredients. You had ingredient availabilities to worry about. Then you had the time that it would take to fatten the doomed beast that would be slaughtered for the feast. Those were all variables. They didn't know exactly when all that would be done. And so they said, we're going to make the preparations for a banquet. You be ready to come when we give the notice. And so you would arrange your schedule, guessing about how long this would take, so that when the announcement came, you could drop everything and go to the banquet. That's basically how it was done. Because everyone wanted to be at the banquet. So guests would wait for the invitation, and finally when it would come, the second invitation, then they would go to the banquet. Those invited never quite knew when that second invitation was going to come, so they had to be ready at all times. Imagine then how off the wall, how utterly incomprehensible the response of those invited to the royal banquet, that royal feast, appeared to Jesus' listeners. They thought this was nuts. Even if for some unfathomable reason you did not want to go to such an elaborate, important event, no one would ever dream of turning down an invitation from the king. The king was the ruler of the land. The king was the most politically powerful person in your life, one who could determine the fate of your life with the wave of a hand. You would not insult this man. How ludicrous to think that anyone would fly in the face of such authority. Besides, who in their right mind would want to miss a royal party, a royal banquet, a royal celebration? If you'd been invited to a uh, coronation of the Queen of England, you would go. If you'd have been invited to the, uh, the feast celebrating the marriage of the prince, you would go, because this is a special occasion. Notice also that this parable features a father and a son. The father is preparing the wedding banquet for his son. The father is the king. It is impossible to miss the obvious reference to the wedding feast of the Lamb that John speaks of in Revelation. This is the celebration of the wedding of Jesus to his bride, the church, the wedding feast, and that is being prepared by the Father. Jesus is obviously speaking of God's gracious invitation to partake of that feast. This is his invitation to salvation, to eternity, to forgiveness, for eternal life with him. Come to the banquet. Live forever. Enjoy the wedding feast of the Lamb. Those who were first invited to the wedding refused the invitation. Only in this parable, in the, in the Luke parable, they offered lame excuses. I mean, who basically would, would buy a field without looking at it first? Who would buy five yoke of oxen without trying them out first to see if they were any good? Those were silly excuses, ridiculous. But in Matthew's account, no, no excuse is given. Just one goes off into the field to work and the other goes about his business and they just ignore the invitation. Some do much worse than that. Some actually take the messengers and kill them. And in those days, since there was no mail service, basically a messenger was someone who was protected. You respected uh, the king's messenger because they had important messages to deliver. But these people took those messengers and killed them. It's hard to miss Jesus' reference to the nasty habits the Jews had throughout the centuries of killing the prophets. The king doesn't just accept the behavior of those who've been invited to his banquet. He sends his army to kill them. He's going to burn their cities. He's going to take his vengeance. Then the king had his servants bring anyone who they could find, the lame, the halt, the blind, beggars, workmen, homemakers, crooks, prostitutes, anyone they could find, bring them all in. Foreigners, doesn't matter, bring them in. When we were planning my daughter's wedding and reception, uh, we sent out the invitations and asked that everyone would RSVP because we needed to know how many we had to prepare the food for and how much money it was going to cost me. We had to know those things, you know? So we asked that people RSVP. But, you know, after the wedding ceremony, my heart was filled with so much joy that I ignored the instructions given to me by my wife and my daughter. I did not just say those who had RSVP'd. I said, anybody here, come with us. 
celebrate my joy with me. Join in my joy. Come join us. My wife's eyes got big. <laughs> But she recovered quickly, and we filled that hall with people. I'm telling you, I don't know how many people we had there, but it was full, and we had a great time together. The king invited everyone to the banquet. Come, fill my house. Fill my house. Celebrate with me. Share in my joy. Share in my celebration, he said. Fill my house. It is said that the two most frequently asked questions in heaven will be these. First of all, where's so-and-so? Thought he'd be here. And the second one is, what are you doing here? <laughs> I shared that with one audience, and afterwards a man came to me and said, I've got a third question, and this is the one I'm going to ask. How on earth did I get here? <laughs> Maybe that's the better question. How on earth did I get here? Don't you know that would be the question a beggar or a prostitute would ask who had been drug into the king's banquet for the wedding feast of his son? They would be seated at the table, this beautiful table with a linen tablecloth, the fine china and this beautiful splendid palace. There they would be seated, this beggar, this street urchin, this prostitute seated there. They'd be constantly asking themselves, how in the world did this happen? How was I yanked in off the street here? Such finery, such wonderful food. They would constantly be looking over their shoulders for fear that someone's going to figure out that they don't belong and throw them out. But that didn't happen. They enjoyed the feast. They were treated like, like honored guests. These were the rejects, the nobodies. But no, they were God's, the king's honored guest. This is, that is all were honored guests except for one. One character did not receive the royal treatment. Look at verses 11 and 12 again of Matthew 22. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. The man was wearing the wrong clothes. Now, when each guest was brought into the royal palace, a beautiful, costly robe was given to them, covering their other clothes. They were asked to wear this. In the streets, they were dressed in rags, but in the palace, they wore a robe of incalculable value. Wearing the right thing makes all the difference. It makes all the difference. When my daughter, again, was getting ready for her wedding, she enlisted her sister and her mother in the task of finding a wedding dress. They looked at catalogs. They went to wedding shows. They went to wedding dress stores. I didn't know there were such things, but there are. They searched the internet until they found the perfect dress. <clears throat> and it cost something. The <laughs> Then we had to find the right getaway dress. I didn't know that this was an important element, but it was. And so again, they searched and searched. And after that was purchased, then it was time for the mother of the bride to find the perfect dress for the mother of the bride to wear. And so I accompanied her to department stores and dress shops, and I looked online with her. Now, you understand, I know absolutely nothing about women's clothing, but my opinion was important. And eventually, in spite of my help, we found just the right dress. And then it was my turn. I cannot tell you how happy I was to learn that my tuxedo still fit. Praise the Lord. <laughs> it was dusty from hanging in the closet all those months. I sent it to the cleaners, and it was great. Mine was the easiest task. Now, tell you the truth, I even remembered how to wear the cummerbund. You know, the cummerbund is, is got folds in it, at least a lot of them do. When I bought the thing, the guy told me, act like it's a crumb catcher. You can't catch crumbs as the folds are pointing down. They gotta be pointing up. So if you've got a cummerbund and you're wondering how to wear it, folds up. If your cummerbund does not have folds, I don't know how to help you. I can't do anything for you. You're on your own. All sorts of things you learn about this. Now, I guess I could have worn blue jeans that day to the wedding, but I'm not certain I'd be out of the hospital yet. It was important that the father of the bride dress appropriately, especially since I was doing the ceremony as well. Not only was I the father of the bride, I was the minister. It was important that I dress appropriately for the occasion. When the king checked on his guest, he found a man who was not properly attired. He had been offered a new suit of clothes, but he failed to wear them at the wedding feast. Instead, 
He attended the wedding feast wearing his own dirty, filthy rags. When asked about his attire, he had absolutely no answer. You've been invited to the wedding feast, the wedding feast of the Lamb. But don't attempt to wear your own clothes. The wedding clothes are the righteousness of Christ. If you come to God on your own merits, you're wearing what Isaiah referred to as filthy rags, and you don't want to know what the exact translation of that phrase is, filthy rags. I'm not going to tell you. But you would not be caught dead wearing them. There's only one appropriate garment to wear for the wedding feast of the Lamb, and that is the robe of Christ's righteousness. Don't trust your own goodness. Trust in the gift of God's grace, the righteousness of Christ. The king has issued an invitation to you. He's invited you to attend the wedding feast of the Lamb. And soon he will come in order that you might attend that banquet for a wonderful celebration that will include praise, food, rejoicing, laughter. It will be the most holy, the most sacred, the most wonderful event of your life, but it will also be the most enjoyable event of your life. It's time to accept the invitation. It's time to make preparations to attend the banquet. Won't you wear the wedding garment that Christ offers to you, the righteousness of Jesus, and attend the banquet? And when you come, prepare, come prepared to laugh you're going to have a great time. I absolutely guarantee it. Pray with me. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the invitation. We gladly accept in the name of Jesus, our Savior, for we pray it in his name. Amen. Christ, we do. We would love to send you a free copy of Pastor Mike Tucker's book, Your Heart's Desire. This easy to read book illustrates God's longing for a relationship with you and how that can fulfill your ultimate heart's desire. Please contact us now for your free copy of Your Heart's Desire by calling toll free at 1-888-940-0062 or log on to our website, www.faithfortoday.tv. Hi, I'm Mike Tucker of Faith for Today Television. I'd like to invite you to attend a series of meetings entitled HeartQuest, Finding the One Who Has Loved You All Along. The meetings begin October 19 at 7 p.m. right here at the Arlington Seventh-day Adventist Church. These grace-filled messages will help guide in your heart's quest, the quest to experience more of God. Don't miss out on this powerful series. For more information, go to heartquest.info. I'll see you here. Few adults over 40 have forgotten the gut-wrenching memory of Korean Airlines Flight KE-007 being shot down by Soviet fighter jets on September 1, 1983. On that fateful night, 240 unsuspecting passengers and crew members were shot down like innocent sparrows in flight. 
The trigger man for the Soviet Union was Major Osipovich, a pilot who wasn't originally scheduled to be in the air during this international travesty. The Major was slated to give a talk about peace at his children's school the next day. So he volunteered for night duty to free enough time to speak during school hours. This adjustment in flight time put him in the position of patrolling the eastern skies when that Korean passenger jet strayed into the forbidden Soviet airspace. In the end, Major Osipovich followed orders and shot down the airliner. How tragic that 240 lives were lost and world powers were pushed dangerously close to catastrophic results because military missiles were fired at a civilian airplane by a pilot preparing to teach children about peace. Character can only be supported by actions, not merely words. Do your actions demonstrate character or do you merely give character lip service? Listen to what James had to say. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom, not forgetting what he has heard but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. I'm Mike Tucker, Speaker Director for Faith for Today, and this has been a Faith Moment. Choose cheese.